Okay, we've got 26, 27 in and everybody's attached their audio, so I'll kick us off. Hi everyone, you're very welcome to our penultimate Q&A with Klaus on growing in polytunnels. Just before we get into the questions, just a, a bit of housekeeping on the last few weeks of the course. So we've got, officially after tonight, we've got one video and one Q&A left, but we're going to change that up a little bit. So as scheduled on Wednesday, we're going to have uh, our video with Rory McGurian, who's an exciting farmer down in, uh, in Cork. So he's going to be the video on next Wednesday. Then the, this day, two weeks, the last Q&A session will be kind of more of a planning for 2021 Q&A. So we'll talk to you about that then. And then Sean and Klaus are going to be filming a final wrap-up session uh, about planning, seed saving, other things that is, you know, to look ahead to the winter. So that'll be your final bonus session. And that'll probably go out, if it, if not the week of the last Q&A, maybe the week after that. So that'll be your, your final session. So Klaus, how are you? I'm very good, thanks. I'm, I'm down in sunny Kilkenny. <laughs> very nice. It's not if, sunny. if there's anybody from Kilkenny, it, it always the sun always shines down there. It's a lovely part of the world. It's <laughs> not very to our place, Kevin. Up, well, it's not very north. nice here in South Leitrim, as as you know. <laughs> as it, as yeah. ever, the rain is. It's a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, the usual Leitrim day. <laughs> Yeah, it, I'm actually work. Uh, I do some consultancy work. It's a very interesting place in um, Kilfane House. It's near okay. Thomastown, and it's it's owned by um, Lorna Byrne. I don't know if anybody heard of Lorna okay, Byrne. Yeah. She she got quite famous um, when she wrote a book about angels in my hair. Okay. She, yeah, very special person, and uh, she got lots of funding and lots of people follow her and gave her lots of money to buy this big estate with a beautiful walled garden in it. And since last September, we are restoring it. So oh, I've been, um, I, I come down once a month for two days and a great gardener, a great young fella who, who does all the work. And it's, it, it probably was abandoned 50 years ago and the fertility is still there. We added very, very little to the soil. And I should have taken a photo to show you that I've never grown carrots like that in my life. Not okay, been growing right. vegetables for 30 years. And they were like in three square meters, we harvested nearly two wheelbarrows full of carrots. Oh, wow. Insane. Like, right, so there's something going on in the soil there, yeah. It's definitely there. It's black, it's crumbly, and it's, it's generations of gardeners having put in compost into right. the soil, yeah. Okay, I will flash up the questions here and everybody should be able to see that now so i'll start us off with selena i'm not sure if selena is there so you're all uh, able to unmute yourselves if we come to your question and um, so selena asks first i'm in the second year of my garden and i've applied heavy mulch of seaweed in both the tunnel and outdoor veg beds in the last two winters this year i've experienced a very high level of slugs Jim mentioned that slugs were due to high bacterial levels and not balancing fungal levels. Would the seaweed be increasing the bacterial element and would I be better applying green manure or leaf mulch in the winter? Hi Klaus, I'm actually online here as well. Hi Great. Selena. How How are are you? Thanks. Good, yeah. thanks. Very good. Yeah, um, I think, are you in the west of Ireland? or? or I am, um, yeah, I'm in Galway yeah. City. Um, so let's say yeah. my... I didn't have as bad a slug issue last year, but definitely this year, um, all my potato crop are destroyed with slugs and yeah, the yeah. tunnel was quite bad with slugs as well. Exactly. So, I'm, so I'm just wondering. I, I, I'm, up, I'm up in Leitrim, Celine, and I can't use mulches because of slugs. So I, okay. I have bare soil. I know, I know mulching is fantastic. It's the best for soil fertility for soil life etc but it, that includes slugs as well unfortunately for me if i would be down in kilkenny or in in a drier area mulching is a fantastic way of of keeping the moisture in of of um enlivening the soil but i think where we are galway leitrim sligo donegal i think not to mulch while you have your crops growing will 100 percent reduce the slug population um 
I, I would use seaweed mulch in winter time as well, like you would. I would have the crops out, potatoes harvested, carrots harvested. And if you have lots of seaweed available, I would spread a thick layer about 20 centimeters, eight inches of seaweed on top of all the beds say from October till February onwards. And then I'd remove whatever is left over of the seaweed with a fork and put it into the compost or, or um, mulch apple trees with it. Just, just get rid of it there because you can't really dig that seaweed into the ground. It's too stringy, whatever is left over. And you'll just have problems with um, uh, making a, a fine seed bed the following year. Yeah, because so, what, uh, I, what I was doing was I was actually digging it in. Like no, I was putting a heavy mulch and then on my potatoes, once the potatoes were going in, I was mulching heavy with seaweed on the potato beds as well. No, I think that's a recipe for slugs, really, okay. in okay. our area. I, I'm not saying in, in the south southeast, uh, so it'll be totally different. You know, you could do definitely do that. Okay. But and I'm what not about sure what you green man manure? Green manure, um, it, you're slightly late. I think for most green manures, you want to have sown them a little bit earlier in the year, like okay. early September, probably. You would still get some, some out in, in the tunnel, definitely. It would be a good idea to sow some something like phacelia or buckwheat. Yeah, and, I have some uh, on one half of the tunnel sown. It's, it's just germinating now. It's probably, yeah, you know. Brilliant. Oh, if it's already germinating, it's, it'll be fine. Okay. And then get rid of it before you plant your crops in, in springtime again. Okay, perfect. Okay, and then Selena's second question. A couple of brown spots have started to appear on butternut squash in the tunnel. Is this rot? And if so, will the squash be still okay to use? And we have a nice photo. Yeah, it, it looks there. like some sort of brown rot on, on squashes, pumpkins and crochets can get that sometimes. That could spread. I, 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 would, I would eat them quickly. Often that's a cause of um, too much humidity, not enough airflow okay. going through the tunnel. Is it quite dense, the tunnel, or lots of leaves? Yeah, there's a lot. I suppose the, the cucumbers and um, the peppers and the squash have kind of taken over a bit at the moment. So yeah, that happens all the time of year, yeah. 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 Would you defoliate quite a lot? A lot of the lower leaves, a lot of the yellowing leaves, get rid of a lot of stuff that's not needed really. You know, the cucumbers okay. up to the first fruit, up to the fruit that's appearing. And op still open the tunnels a lot every yeah. day. But the two that have that, I just eat them as quick as you could. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Klaus. No problem, Celine. Thanks, Selena. Uh, next, we have Graham. Uh, Graham has two questions. The sec first question is about a soil analysis, which we'll go to in a second. Uh, but his question here about cabbages. Uh, I have a question about cabbages. Please see image. What can we do about this? We've removed several of the cabbages that have been badly damaged. I might zoom out a little bit here so we can get it all in. And is, is Graham there? Yeah. Graham is there, I think. Yes, Graham. Perfect. Yep. Is it is it uh, is it aphids? It looks like the woolly aphid to me. Are these little creatures, the grey things inside? Yes, white on the backs of the leaves. So what yeah. we would the the heart of some of the cabbages were eaten away. So we just took those away and sprayed the rest. But we just used um, washing up liquid. And water. Uh, yeah, but the grey parts, they're, they're, they're aphids, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's the woolly, woolly aphid. That comes now at this time of the year to all your winter crops, like Brussels sprouts get it terribly, kale can get it, um, cabbages like the Savoy that you have here can get it. Just for, for other people now that what I did today here in Kilkenny, I removed all the yellowing leaves of the, the lower leaves of the cabbages, of the kale, of the Brussels sprouts, especially anything from the bottom up. That's very good housekeeping and you should do, nearly do that every day. Uh, I'm sorry, every week. And, that, and that's literally, that's just to prevent aphids from coming up to find, find a foothold in it. So do tidy up all your brassicas from the bottom up, any kind of discolored leaves on a regular basis. Now they're right in the center here. That's terrible. 
And did you say, Graham, that you cut off the head, the centre? No, we, what we did was the ones that were really badly damaged, we took them out. And the whole plant out, yeah. Yeah, your uh, suggestion uh, ended up with a very big plastic bag this morning of yellow leaves and whatnot. So yeah. we've removed them. What I was concerned about is we have purple sprouting broccoli in an adjacent bed in the polytunnel. So I didn't want this bloody thing to spread, pardon the French. Oh, are they in the tunnel, these cabbages? Yes. Oh, that explains it. Throw, plant them outside. They don't like the warmth. No. They're, they're ah. cold crops. They like the cold. They like the Irish cold, the winter, the fresh air. You can't, don't, don't grow autumn cabbages, winter cabbages in the tunnel. Okay. Good. Yeah, no, they, they, they do well outside. I've, I've never seen it so bad, you know, and in the center, but in a, in a confined area, they, they never do well. Mm -hmm. okay. Even even your sprouting broccoli, no, that, that should be fine, but you'll get very early purple sprouting broccoli. You'll probably get it before Christmas even, rather than the following spring, like you would if you had them outside. Mm -hmm. Good. That, but that might have been a, your intention. I, I'd throw them out, get rid of them. Okay, will do. And, and try and save your um, your purple sprouting broccoli instead. Okay. And ventilate, keep your tunnel doors open as much as you can. Mm, which we do. Yeah. Uh, both ends. Brilliant. Uh, I, okay. I, I might flip up Graham's, this is Graham's soil oh, brilliant. analysis. Brilliant. And from my own trained eye, it looks like good news, Klaus, I think, is it? No. No. <laughs> there you go. I'm always turning. Um, there was one thing I wanted to say to Graham. Yeah, there there is a biological control for green for aphids you could buy from Fruitil Farm. I think it's is it Phytocelius or something like that, which would know. control them. But it's it they are too far advanced really to for be now. saved. Yeah, okay. for them. Um, yeah, no, your soil test doesn't look good, but it just shows how important it is to do a soil test, really, because you learn so much. The two important bits, uh, Kevin, if you could highlight phosphorus and potassium. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the, these two are the, the major nutrients. Mm -hmm. Plants need N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in high quantities. The mm -hmm. others it needs in small doses and small quantities. So the NPK is like uh, carbohydrates and protein, while the others are the vitamins and the trace elements. So you're very low on potassium on level one. Look, 120 would be the range here, but you only yeah. have 37. Mm -hmm. And phosphorus is very low mm -hmm. as well. And you're extremely low in boron. Yeah, absolutely. Boron is, is one of the major requirements for brassicas. Brassicas suffer badly if they don't have enough boron. Cauliflowers, cabbages, a swede especially, you know, the turnips, they get a lot of problems if they don't have boron. So you'd need to add, I, I would add farmyard manure or garden compost at a very generous rate, say one wheelbarrow for every three meters of a bed. Right. I would actually go and mulch your purple sprouting broccoli. Is that from the tunnel, actually? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would. I would add a bucket full of good garden compost or composted farmyard manure, or even buy. Do you know the Chi Up product? Yes. G E E Up, um, mm -hmm. and put one bucket of it around each purple sprouting broccoli. Wow. Because there's definitely not enough food in, in the ground for them. They're big plants. They're greedy plants. You want to keep them keep them happy. They sure are. Now, the boron, there mightn't be sufficient boron in to add that up. So you, you might have to get a separate boron fertilizer, which you can get as well. Which I got from Fruit Hill. Brilliant. And add that generously, you know, like regularly. Or oh, did, did you only add it after the soil test? We haven't added it yet. Okay. So, yeah. So keep monitoring it. Maybe ask Fruitil Farm how much you should add, you know, to bring it up to level three. 
Okay, I'll ask Elmer what mm. his thoughts are. Yeah, he is very good at calculating those sort of things. Mm. That's very helpful, Klaus. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thanks, Graham. You're welcome, Kevin. Um, next up, we've got Kat. Kat asked my question for Klaus and Sean. Uh, unfortunately, Sean isn't here tonight. He might have been the man for this, but uh, we'll let Klaus bash away. We have just erected our first ever polytunnel, 12 feet by 20 feet. We shall be growing food for our own use, not commercial. I haven't let out the beds yet, and I'm resisting the urge to rush in and plant madly. Any advice for a rookie grower like me, much appreciated, such as things I wish I'd done differently when starting my polytunnel and some common pitfalls. Yeah. Um, sorry, Kath, what's a rookie? A beginner. Hi, Klaus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't come across that, sorry. Yeah. It's a pity that Sean isn't here, but just a couple of things that uh, Sean um, mentioned I said I said to Sean not to put in wooden timber edgings and not to put gravel in for paths and just have soil beds and soil paths. Of course, he wouldn't listen to me. You know, he put his tim in timber edge in and gravel paths and everything is... Um, I think he regrets it. Yeah. Big time. He also put the timber edging next to the plastic for some strange reason. And then there's weeds growing out from the back, which he actually can't get to it. So that's a couple of, of things. I, I don't think, unless, of course, if you're maybe an older and want to have more comfort and you could have a raised bed sufficiently high, but there is no need in a tunnel. Raised beds are for drainage in theory. So the water can escape. If you live in Leitrim or have come to Leitrim, you'd know what I mean or many other counties, so raised beds are for good drainage. But in a tunnel, you actually don't need it, unless you really want it for comfort. And then I totally understand it. Raised beds means more money, because you need the edging, you need to add soil, which isn't your own soil, you need to add compost, etc. So that's one mistake he made. Another one I think he regretted terribly is cramming things in. Every beginner makes that mistake planting things too close you know he thinks a little plant and then put another little plant into it next to it and suddenly they become massive he curses me about it. i gave him a, pro a present of a yakon plant did you see it kevin i see yeah he mentioned it to me yeah he, he probably curses me every day over it it was a <laughs> tiny little cute little plant and it's now two meters tall and it strangles his sweet um sweet potatoes and peppers and everything else so stick to spacing and 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 that yeah was there anything in particular kat you you were looking we're at the, we're, we're, we're going up with we put it up about four days ago and we're going away on holiday for a week should i be doing anything to the soil we've, we've put topsoil in um 12 tons because the um the soil and um, that where we've erected it was very poor yeah so is it all right to just leave it or should we water it or yeah, that's, not, that's a, a good good question, really. When people leave the tunnel for the winter time, mm. and it often dries out completely, I, I'd love to keep the soil moist because I believe the life in the soil needs to be looked after as well. Yeah, that's what and, we thought. And kept, kept alive, really, because you don't want to have it like a desert in winter yeah. time. You, you'd want it. So, yeah, keep it, keep it. Somebody mentioned green manures. If, if you don't use it for the winter, you could sow a green manure of phacelia in, or, or you could decide to grow winter salads. Yeah, like yeah. I'll start with winter rocket. salads, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, that's grand. Good. Thank you, Kat. Thanks, Kat. And Klaus, most of my days in the office are spent with Sean not listening to me, so I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next up we've got Barbara. Uh, Barbara says, I really enjoyed the last video with Jim. Very generous in sharing his knowledge and experience. My question is about his no-dig garden bed preparation. He said he used silage to cover the ground. Can I use other material like cow manure, four months old, still kind of fresh, instead, as this is what I have on hand? Yeah, that, that, that was quite amazing what we've seen there. So um, I don't know how clear he was with it all. The silage was rolled out onto flattened grass, 
plastic, black plastic put over, and then he planted potatoes through it. And that grew, and he left the plastic on for that year while he had the potatoes. Then it was lifted, the black plastic. And the second year, the silage has broken down to ne next to nothing. And then he could start to plant other crops into, into it with a little semi-decomposed silage. So that, that was a great, um, simple way of doing it. You have cow, cow manure is totally different to silage. Cow manure would be quite rich, but I think, I think if you'd put that cow manure on now, say on, on the ground that you want to use next year and cover it straight away with the black plastic, that cow manure then will decompose quite quickly over the winter months and it should be nearly semi-decomposed. And then I think you could still plant your potatoes in like Jim Cronin said, yeah. But not if, I think if you were to do it in springtime. See what I mean is if you put it on now, the soil, the worms, the decomposing grass and the warmth underneath will actually decompose, break down the cow manure, mix it with the decomposing grass, mix it with the soil. So you'd have a nice mix, hopefully by next um, early April and you cut little holes in and you plant your seed potatoes through it. Okay, thanks Barbara. Next up we've got Elaine, two questions and I see Elaine there so you can unmute Elaine. Do you have any tips on using red clover as a cover crop for the home gardener? I've just planted some red clover in my vegetable patch to grow over winter and I understand it'll flower next summer. However, I only have a small amount of space to grow vegetables and don't want to dedicate the space to red clover for the full summer. So could I leave some of the red clover growing next summer and plant, plant the vegetables amongst it? Yeah, red, red clover wasn't the best choice really. Red clover is a fantastic green manure, but it's, it's really one that you want to give a whole season. Okay. You know, the fallow year, the, the one year where you don't grow anything, one in four, one in five years. It's a soil fertility building crop. As, an overwintering green manure, I think if you sow it in autumn, it doesn't really establish full enough, sufficiently enough to make it worth it. Right, okay. um, it'll only start to grow next spring, probably to its full potential when you, as you said earlier, you don't want to use it. So your next question is, can you uh -huh. grow stuff through it? I, I would have used a white clover for that. White clovers or subterranean white clovers, they're not as vigorous as clover. Red clover is just like mad. It grows like wildfire. Um, while white clover stays smaller. And on white clover, I, you could easily grow kale, Brussels sprouts, or you know a lot of tall brassica crops through it. Okay. So probably no is the answer, unless you want to go with the clippers every two weeks and clip the red clover. You plant your kale through it and clip the red clover every two weeks with shears down. Actually, that could be a nice idea, but at least every two weeks because the clover would otherwise compete with your main crop, with your okay. kale. Okay, thanks. And then I found a huge amount of yellow and black caterpillars on a kale plant a few weeks ago. I think there were caterpillars of the large white butterfly. Any tips to help prevent these returning next year? Yeah, um, covering. As soon as you plant your kale or cabbages or Brussels sprouts, you could put a netting over it. You could put four pegs on the side and put a netting over it, or you can drape it over, or you can make mm. large cloches just to, and use a crop cover. It's a thicker netting. It's just to stop the butterflies from, from laying the eggs onto the brassicas. That's all you need to do. So really? there isn't anything you could plant that would put off the butterflies? No. I mean, okay. Why not you? I mean, there is, under, there, there is research on undersowing, what we just covered earlier, the white clover. Okay, yeah. But that only reduces the butterflies. So you get much less. Yeah. Maybe it stops a few, but I, I wouldn't argue that it would get rid of them all. There is a biological control called um, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. And there's another and one I've never come across, or only heard recently, is some sort of fungus that you can spray over your brassicas and that gets rid, gets rid of them as well. Okay. Okay. 
Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Elaine. There was a question there, um, Kevin, popped up about farmyard manure in relation oh, to the okay. previous one. Did you see that, that? on the chat? Uh, oh, yeah, it's from Katrina. I put farmyard manure on my outside beds at a rate of one barrow per meter. Is that too much, given your earlier comment? We intend covering it for the winter with plastic. Far too much, unfortunately, Katrina, yes. If the department would be after you, they'd be suing you. <laughs> it's, um, there's a nitrates directive um, in, in Europe and the maximum amount of nitrogen that you apply is um, 170 kilos per hectare and farmyard manure contains 4.5 kilos per ton. Anyway, long story short, one, one wheelbarrow per meter it would be about six or 700 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. So it, it'll be far too much, yeah. Okay, we'll make sure to keep this on the private link, Katrina, so, so the department... So one, one in three yeah. would be very generous and probably also exceeding it. So one, one, one wheelbarrow in three square meters would be the absolute maximum I, I would apply. And once your soil gets better, maybe one in four the next year, and then one wheelbarrow in five square meters. Okay. And is it, is it the same for the tunnel or less than that in the tunnel? You could probably, in the tunnel, you could do a bit more. You know, you could stick to the one in three always because you harvest a lot more and you take taken off a lot more out of it. Okay. So you, you're using more nutrients. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that news. Katrina. Thanks, Katrina. And also, uh, regarding Kat's question earlier, Sean O'Connell says, raised beds, although comfortable, also mean you need more watering in the tunnel from his experience. I, I totally agree, Sean. Yeah, yeah. You have to water all the time if you have raised beds, definitely. Okay, next up we've got Eamon. So Eamon has two questions. I think the first one, I planted Sharps Express in the polytunnel for Christmas and they got blight. See photos. I have sprayed them with seaweed extract. Is there any chance they could come back? Got two photos there. I can't see any blight, can you? Is Eamon there? Eamon yeah, there? there is. Eamon, yeah, was that before the blight or after the blight? Oh, that, that's after the blight. There, there's a small bit of blight on the, on the leaves, you know? I can't, I can't see. Oh, there is. You here? Yeah. Is that there? Yeah, that's it there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Eamon, have you ever done potatoes for Christmas before? No, I never did. It was my first time and probably my last time. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I can see a bit of blight there on the stem, yeah. Yeah. I, I would never, ever do it. I think it's the biggest gardening gimmick and the biggest exploitation money waster ever, you know, invent, invented from garden centers. All you'd ever get is trouble. Like if you sow potatoes late, you're in the blight season and then the frost season as well. So the first touch of frost, which will come inevitably, will kill them off. And what you'll ever get is small little potatoes, small little baby potatoes. And I don't understand, when you harvest your main crop potatoes now, everybody throws these baby potatoes out, isn't it? They were too small. You only keep the big ones. So my suggestion for the future is keep all the baby potatoes that you harvest now from your main crop. Put them separate and pretend they are freshly harvested Christmas potatoes. <laughs> and oh. and um, if you store them in soil, you know, layers of sand or, or layers of soil in, in a cool shed or in a cellar, they'll keep just as good and they're, they're just going to be like freshly dug potatoes. I would never think that would work. I, I'd be very surprised if you get bigger than um, a tennis ball sized potatoes out of it. Yeah, I, I might actually dig them out and put something else in. Yeah, it, it's only hassle really. It's, it's yeah. a money making gimmick, you know, for later in the year. Okay, thanks. And secondly then, I do not know why the autumn raspberries growing against the wall are doing well. I planted them late May this year from an overgrown bed. As they're planted on top of the wall foundations, I had to use a raised bed filled with some homemade compost to get some depth. I mulched them with cardboard and shredded bark. I have a large number of autumn raspberry canes to plant in October, November. So any advice is welcome. 
I mean, there's some two nice pictures of the. No, you, I think, Eamon, you have to give oh. us advice. They look phenomenal. <laughs> they look amazing. Yeah, but, but the problem is, Klaus, I don't know what bit of what I did was the reason that they are grown well. I dug down into the soil a bit, and there's a lot of um, my mycorrhizal fungi in the soil as well. Oh, Maybe. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the mulching will help spread that as well, huh? Yeah, yeah. The wood chip mulch. Brilliant. Yeah. They oh. are, they're, they're a woodland plant, aren't they, the, the raspberry? They are. They are. They like the moist moisture, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, I'll try and get a kind of more fungally based compost in, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're definitely doing the right thing. Raspberries are very temperamental. I don't know why. There's some places I can't grow in Cork. I, I, I work at a place and we can't grow them. We try different varieties and, and they, they some sort of get some sort of disease. None of them look like yours here. Yeah. And then in Bundoran this year, for some reason, we had them for 10 years and it's the first really great year of raspberries. Where they're not misshapen, you know, and, and miserable. So well the, only thing, the only thing is um, with organic raspberries, they're hard to get. If you could grow them well, you could actually sell them quite heavily, you know. They're not available at all. You're so right. Yeah. You're so right. And, and I think... We, we kind of neglect our, our own fruit a little bit. There's so many super fruits about, isn't it? Goji and yeah. good knows what. But I, I bet you the raspberries and the black currants, aren't they just, they're probably just as healthy, if not more so. They just I haven't had the marketing plot yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lars. That's good. Yeah. Well done, Thanks. Eamon. Thanks, Eamon. And Mary well, I has I missed in that the chat. The raspberries. Did you see that, Kevin? Yes, Mary says, a fantastic year for autumn raspberries. Picked 10 pounds outside the kitchen yesterday. Summer raspberries were a disaster. Okay, so it's a good year. Yeah, for yeah. it must be. So they must like the moisture summer, huh? Maybe. Okay, we're going to move on. This was one I grouped together because there were two, two similar questions. Beatrice and Mary's first question. Uh, Beatrice says, can you advise me on what I should do with empty beds in the outside veg garden over the winter? Do I cover them with compost or plant green manure or plant a crop in them? Any advice appreciated? And then Mary asks, uh, what's the best way to prepare outdoor beds for the winter? So in green manure, covering with black plastic or covering with compost? So you might take the two of them together, Klaus. Yeah, yeah. You have, you have a number of options. The one option I wouldn't do is to spread compost now and leave it over the winter compost or, or manure and then leave it open or or even dig it that would be a no 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 okay that's what what you do in colder climates in germany or in you know where you get cold frosty winters with little rain so do not dig and work work in farmyard manure now that's that's what you shouldn't do and the reason for that is you get plenty of rain in winter and that will wash the nutrients out that you have applied to it. The winters are still mild, you still have weeds growing through it and and, and little, the, the soil can turn into a bit of a mash when you do that. So no digging, no spreading of compost now and not covering them. Um, so that leaves you with three options, isn't it? One is, which we covered earlier, spread a lot of seaweed and just don't even weed your beds anymore. Like harvest your crochets, harvest your carrots. Don't worry about excess weeds and just give a thick cover of the seaweed on it. The seaweed will suppress the weeds, will slowly re release the nutrients. All the benefits go into it and then in spring you leave it. So number one is seaweed. Number two, a green manure crop. That's the best ecological way, but the hardest as well. And I mentioned earlier, we're slightly late maybe for phacelia and buckwheat. You do, want, you do want a certain height of the green manure to be able to stop the leaching of nutrients. So you want at least 20 centimeters. I don't think you'll get that now if you sow phacelia or buckwheat, which are the, these two are the fastest growing ones. You could still do it maybe if you're in a warmer part of the country, like in the Southeast, you could do that. Um, the laziest way is your plastic way. So you could, again, don't worry too much about weeds. Don't weed them anymore. Spread your compost or your manure at 
the rate of one to three, one wheelbarrows of three square meters, or if you have good soil, one wheelbarrow every five meters of five square meters of soil, spread it and then cover it immediately with black plastic. Make sure that the black plastic is, you know, not blowing around, uh, tuck it in on the sides and put some weight on top or even some wood chip on top to hold it down. And yeah, it's maybe not the most ecologically friendly one, but it's the easiest one because in springtime you lift it. When you lift it, you can collect the slugs that are hiding on the plastic and your soil is, there's no weeds in it. Everything is broken down. The manure had time to break down the grass or the weeds have broken down. Worms seem to love it. It's kind of, especially I think in the Northwest where, where it's, we have wet winters and, and, you know, it takes a long time in springtime to dry out. I think it's a very good option for, for that part. And you can reuse the plastic if, you, if you're careful with it and fold it nicely. Okay, and you mentioned seaweed. Mary's second question there, I collected seaweed at the weekend. What is the best way to use this now? If I put it on the beds, should I cover it with grass clippings or mulch? Yeah, I mentioned that, huh? Great. And yeah. then... And then question from Bernard uh, just came up. No, I do not cover the seaweed with black plastic. So if you spread seaweed 20 centimeters, a lot thicker than you would imagine, not just a scattering of it. Yeah, it has to be eight inches deep at least. And um, so don't concentrate on some beds. Don't make it spread over the whole garden. Do some areas properly. Uh, and you, you don't need to put black plastic on it, no, because it's a slow release of the nutrients going through. Okay. Um, the white fly question, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's definitely the best way of breeding white flies to close your polytunnel doors and, and uh, have a high humidity. Sorry, your neighbor didn't do your favor, huh? No. Disaster, <laughs> um, I can't get rid of it. Are you, are you planning to grow stuff over the winter? Well, I was maybe salads and that, but my priority really is to get rid of the white fly before I put anything else into the, into yeah. the greenhouse. Have, and have you lots of um, plants in at the moment? I stripped most out and the plan is to strip the rest tomorrow, unless you have a very good suggestion for me. No, that's a good idea. Like uh, stripping out, are you stripping out anything that you can harvest still or? Yeah, I've already taken out all the tomatoes and the cucumbers. So I have some French beans that will come out and the rest were seedlings. Yeah, oh, that's a nightmare for you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, it'll, it will sort itself out. You know, if they don't have food, they won't live. Simple as that, really. Keep it ventilated and tidy it all up. Get rid of all the weeds and everything and... Yeah, that, that should work it out. And then if, if you are worried for the following spring, you could get a biological control, phytocelius, or there's a couple of them. I'm not sure if phytocelius is the right, I think it is the right one, that specially feed on, on aphids. So that might work. There's also a homemade spray, but I'm not really allowed to say it. It's illegal to use homemade pesticides or to promote them even. But will I tell you anyway? <laughs> We're all friends here, Klaus. We're all friends. Use it. I, I, okay, I give you a, a fertilizer one that might do that as well. You soak nettles, get, get a kilo of nettles and five liters of water, chop the nettles, leave it to stew for 24 to 48 hours strain it and spray that onto your plants and do that on three consecutive days. That's fairly effective for aphids as well. But you're, here. but you're only using it as a feed, okay? If anybody catches you from the Department of Agriculture. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Uh, Claire asks in the chat there, Klaus, about manure. How old should the manure be to spread now, to spread on the beds? Is there a big difference with horse manure and age? Thanks. Yeah, the, the older the better is a general rule.
but the age isn't the ma- age and maturity is a different thing. I could get manure done in eight weeks from fresh to fully decomposed. Okay, and that you'd achieve by turning it. If you were to turn the manure every five days from the left to the right, from the right to the left with a pitchfork or with a manure fork, it'll be fully broken down within six to eight weeks. If you get a pile of manure from a farmer and you keep it in a heap and don't touch it, in a year's time, it could still look the same, especially in the center, it'll be still smelly and still quite raw and, and not finished. So age and maturity are two different things. So use well decomposed manure. You, you can't make any mistakes for well decomposed manure. But I said earlier, if you put it in now on the ground and you cover it with black plastic, that's the crucial bit. New, fresh manure, smelly manure has its nutrients available now. So if you leave that out and the rain comes, it washes out the nutrients straight away because they're available now. With old manure, that's already soil-like, you would not have the same problem. The leaching is there. So now, if you get it now, you can use semi-fresh manure, spread it onto, onto the ground and cover it straight away with plastic and it'll be fine. Time, you have six months before next spring and it's finally scattered in contact with soil and weeds. So it should be okay. So you would cover the manure, Graham was asking, yeah. After you I, would, I would cover manure if, yes. Okay. Even if you get a pile of manure in from, from somebody, cover it with plastic or, or some some moisture excluding material. Okay, we'll move on to Aideen. Uh, enjoyed the visit to Jim Cronin. Does he only use overhead irrigation or has he other watering systems? I'm not sure about that, Klaus. You? No, I think he has, has uh, ground uh, uh, drip irrigation for the tomatoes. I, I'm fairly sure he does. Yeah, I think he does. We'll, we'll, we'll check with Sean as well. Yeah. Uh, can you recommend any books or website with more info on the bacterial versus fungal soil types and how that all works? And that's apart from signing up for Sean's Biofarm Conference, which obviously well, we, reckon, we recommend. We well, sign, sign up for Jim's composting course, or is it too late, Kevin? That just finished yesterday, unfortunately, now, yeah. But we will be running that again in probably... Yes, yeah, sign up to year. that. It, it, it was kind of a new concept for me as well, um, Aideen the bacterial and fungal soil types. And, and yeah, I, I, I would always have thought they kind of work together. And one, one type, a fungal soil is one that is less disturbed. So the no dig gardens and the mulched gardens with wood chip would be tending to be more a fungal soil. While the bacterial soil is, say if you turn a compost heap, you encourage more the bacterial players in it. Um, yeah, but I, it was a new concept for me as well. So definitely turn up to Jim's composting course next year. It, it was especially when he mentioned that, that it, it deters slugs and snails. So I really uh, thought, oh, I have to learn more about that. Um, so I was hoping there was somewhere you could exactly, yeah, learn yeah. more. Yeah. Kevin, will you be able to ask Jim if, if there's any reference or books or... Yes, I can say that to him. Yeah, we actually we had a a Q and A based on his composting course last night. So what I might do is I might uh, I might ask him if if he could give us point us in the direction of of yeah, it'd be very interesting. Yeah. I, I know he did. Somebody asked him about that yesterday, and he recommended watching. Now this will sound like a plug, but he recommended watching Dr. Christine Jones, who spoke at our conference last year and is speaking again this year. So if you go onto our website and ask that I. You go to the video section, you'll see Dr. Christine Jones's talk from last year. And Jim did recommend that as far as bacterial and fungal from yesterday's Q&A off the top of my head, I can remember. But otherwise, I, w- I will be speaking to Jim soon. We're doing a live thing with him in a couple of weeks. So I'll bring that up, uh, Aideen. Thank you. I, I, definitely, I would definitely recommend. That was a mind-blowing lecture, um, Christine Jones, from last year's Biofarm. Everybody should watch that. I think that was... I made a lot of changes in my way of gardening since the, you know, since, since her talk. I, I thought that was amazing. Um, 
Number three then from Aideen, what have you found to be the best way to save tomato seeds? Well, that's, that's such fun, tomato seeds. I do that. I've spent the last few weeks saving tomato seeds and whenever I go to somebody's garden, I ask for a few tomatoes and I come home. I don't know how many varieties I've saved now. It's, it's, it's really, really good fun. So what you do is you, you, you pick the best plant. Say if you have 10, 10 plants of, or five plants of one variety, pick the two best plants that grow best. Then you pick the best tomatoes from that, those two plants. So continuously selecting. And then you let them mature on the plant, nearly rotting on the plant till it gets really, really soft. So nearly that you can't eat them anymore. And then you, you cut them open, squeeze out the gunk with this, the liquid into a glass. And then you leave that for 24 hours. And then you have a, a strainer, you know, the sieve things. And you pour that into that large sieve and under the running tap, you squeeze out all the gunk. And then you put it, in, I don't ever put it onto tissue paper or paper or newspaper. I've made that mistake a couple of times, unfortunately. It takes me a while to learn. The best is, um, do you know, the baking trays, the very smooth baking trays or, or a plate, nice plate, and put the seeds out after you strain them. And then you leave them in the warmest place of your house, if you have a hot press or something else, for two days, three days till they're dry. Well, every day you kind of rub it, rub them loose a little bit. They can get quite stuck onto it. And um, say from 10 tomatoes, you would get 5,000 tomato seeds or, or 2,000 tomato seeds, enough for, for an acre of, of tomatoes protected. So it's a very, very easy. Now, you can, tomatoes are self-fertile. That means they don't cross-pollinate. So even if you have five varieties of tomatoes in a tunnel, they will come true to type. Okay, so you can save seeds from all your tomatoes and you don't need to worry that they hybridize and cross like most other vegetables actually would. You can't oh. do the same with cabbages. If you have cabbages and Brussels sprouts and kale, all flowering at the same time, you will get the weirdest hybrids ever, you know, but none, not the Brussels sprout or cabbage or kale. It'll all be something different. Um, the only thing you need to watch out for is F1 hybrids. If it says F1 at the back of the packets, like my favorite tomato is Sun Gold, and it's an F1 hybrid. So that was crossed by somebody with a little brush two different varieties, two different tomato varieties crossed. If you save seeds from those, they will not become the same as the mother sun gold. They will revert a little bit to their original parents and will never be as good as sun gold, unfortunately. So people say F1 hybrids, you cannot save seeds. That's a lie. You can save seeds, but they will not be the same as the original. Does that make sense, Kevin? Roughly. Yep, that does make sense, absolutely. Thanks, Klaus. Um, we'll move on. Lorraine has uh, a bit of a mystery here. These grew from nowhere in my polytunnel. I had set courgettes, which are nearly finished, but are these squash? And are they ready to harvest and cook? And we have two pictures of them here. So where did they come from, if they came from nothing? <laughs> are you there, Lorraine? Not sure Lorraine is there. Yeah, they're squash, they're squash plants. But that, There's another picture here. It's very unusual if they... It's like a bit of an ushiki, young ushiki curry, maybe squash. Okay, Lorraine isn't there, but uh, yeah, you think they're ushiki or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely a squash. Okay. And they could be left with squashes... Um, and pumpkins, the order, the winter squashes, they actually store really well for the winter time, but you need to leave them outside until, until all the leaves have died back, but before the first frost. So if, if there were to be a an early frost coming, they would kill all your pumpkins and squashes outside. 
but if you harvest them too early, they won't store because the skin hasn't hardened off yet. And are these ready to harvest yet, Klaus? No, no, no. You can eat one, definitely. But say if you have twenty or thirty of them, you could they wouldn't store yet. But of course, you can eat it, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, next, Anne asks, I would like to start composting. Can I put farmyard manure in the same mix with grass cutting, straw, etc., or should it be composted separately? I won't have large quantities of it. And if I can, is it green ingredient or brown? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, definitely, yes, is the answer. The more diversity you have in a compost, the better. So you will have manure, grass cuttings, and straw, and then you'll also have your garden waste your weeds, your offcuts from your herbaceous pruning from your herb garden. So the more you mix it and the more you layer it, the better. So straw is brown, grass cuttings are green and farmyard manure. What do you think is farmyard manure? It's farmyard neutral. Manure. It's neutral. neutral okay, mostly, right. mostly neutral because the manure itself is green because it's high in nitrogen but a good farmer will use some bedding for the cows and that's straw or if it's horse manure it'll be sawdust so it's the sawdust is the brown and the horse droppings would be green so that's neutral so that that's on its own you don't need to worry if it's a layer as a green or a brown because it's it's neutral okay thanks Anne. Um, last on my document here is Clementine and Bernard also asked this in the chat. At Jim Cronin's farm, what material did he use on outdoor paths? It looked like gravel. I'm just trying to think, Klaus. I think it was gravel, wasn't it? It was gravel, yeah. Lovely pea gravel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that. And the soil in the polytunnel looked very dry. Is this a problem with a no-dig method? I, I think it was just the surface that looked dry. You know, once you go in a little bit, it, it's, it's quite moist. People, I think, generally overwater. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go now to some of the questions in the chat that we missed. I'd leave it on a nice photo of the squash there. Um, Magella asks, is there less nutrient in horse manure rather than cattle manure? Not really uh, from that point, but yes, from another point. Uh, horse horse people are more the horses are better looked after than cows <laughs> generally and they get more bedding and they're often bedded with sawdust or wood chip isn't it and uh, how will i explain that maybe i did it in the composting course already uh, sawdust is much 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 more brown than straw so if you mix manure, if, if there's manure bedded with sawdust, there's much less nitrogen in it as if there would be, if it would be bedded with straw. I don't know if that makes sense. Straw has got a C and carbon nitrogen ratio of 60 to one, while sawdust has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 400 to one. To balance that, to bring that down, you need an awful lot more manure. So horse manure is, Slightly dangerous, in speaking English again, hopefully, slightly more dangerous in the fact that um, it, there's too much sawdust in it. And if you still see it, it could rob the nitrogen from the ground. You could actually do something bad. So with horse manure, make sure that you compost it really, really well, that the wood chips or sawdust isn't actually visible anymore, hardly, that it's fully broken down. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah, that makes Maybe. sense. Yeah. Um, or am I waffling Mary, too much? No, that's okay. Mary asks, any views on hydroponics? My family want to give me a present of a hydroponic kit to counter lockdown. Is that that stuff where there's no soil at all, Cliffs? Yeah, totally legal. <laughs> in, in organics, uh, hydroponics isn't isn't permitted and I think quite rightly so um, the whole philosophy of of growing is to enliven the soil enliven the earth feed the soil and the soil in return feeds our plants and these plants that are full of the life of the soil and 
the life of the earth and the earth forces are giving us the proper nutrients. That does not happen in hydroponics. We'll all become robots if we eat hydroponic feed food. Hydroponics is literally, um, our, th th these plants are fact like factory farmed hens. They never see the earth, the soil. It's a nutrient solution. It's like being on a drip feed. No, it is a drip feed. They're, they're in a nutrient solution, get all the nutrients that they need and grow in, in that climate, in an artificial climate with artificial light, often with artificial heat. And I, I, I would not be a fan at all of hydroponics. I know there's a lot of people, you know, the techie kind of people who, who think of building big city skyscrapers that would feed cities with all nutrients recycled flowing through. But for me, there's an extra quality of growing and, and that's the earth, that's the soil and it's caring for the land and it's, it's back to basics really. Okay, and there was one question I missed there from Birgit, it went to a, a different email. So I'm just gonna switch across the screen share one second now. And um, so Birgit, you might be able to explain this maybe a bit better than me. So I built a two meter by one eight and 3.6 meter tall timber frame as a future greenhouse with a pointed roof to raise my seedlings in early spring and keep my tomatoes out of the rain. I'm wondering what to cover it with and uh, what would be best, perspex, polycarbonate, acrylic, PVC corrugated or flat, which thickness is best? Uh, are they suitable compared to greenhouse plastic sheeting in regards of light spectrum and UV stability, longevity? Thank you. Can they be tightened against wind? So okay, I'll answer best, that first. What That's, best is for? The answer is polycarbonate sheeting. That's the one to be used. Perspex lasts a year and then it gets milky and the light transmission is bad. Corrugated, no, it's polycarbonate cheating. Is the polycarbonate are the different qualities where one has to be? There's different thicknesses, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, it, it depends on the price as well. You know, the thinner ones, they break probably easier than the thicker ones, but the, the light transmission is best on polycarbonate. There's a company called um, um, Peppermint Farm in Cork, Bantry Cork. They do little, they do greenhouses and they only use polycarbonate. They don't use gr uh, glass at all. And um, on their website maybe, they, they might show you what thickness they have. My greenhouse that I had before was quite a big greenhouse and I first had glass on the roof and I'd never do it again. Because once a big glass pane breaks, it's nearly impossible to go up on the roof and replace a large sheet of glass two meters by one meter. So all the broken ones I replaced with the thinnest and cheapest polycarbonate sheeting I have, because it's not cheap either. Yeah. Um, I read in an old 70s book about cloches that the PVC should let the infrared light easier through. Yeah. Um, I wasn't you, sure. You spoke it. about that? It's an, an old book about cloches from 1977. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the cloche gardening, Chase. Yeah. That's, oh, that's, that's a great book, actually, isn't it? Yeah. I have it actually here. Um, no, I, I, my video is not working. But you otherwise. see polycarbonate mightn't have existed then yet in 1977. No, but he says um, PVC, um, let's corrugate PVC, let's the infrared light through, better through. Yeah. But so does polycarbonate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's that's the one which is generally recommended. Yeah. Um, how about putting a lime wash on the on the polycarbonate? Because no, no, no? it never gets strong. If you live in uh, Spain, maybe. Yeah. Or the southeast of England, or no, we we never get that heat. No. Okay, and how about um, the house, the greenhouse is very small and um, I'm not sure about the bionet, but I'm thinking, I'm, I'm afraid about the, the green fly as well. Um, because I had it already in a porch that I used just to raise little seedlings and it didn't work out because of the green fly. Mm. So, yeah, it's a small space. You, either you'd have a lot of windows and openings that the air can go through and in. But yes, the um, um, the bionet 
is 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 a very good material. You you wouldn't get a mini green fly with that. Plants are stronger that way. Yeah, but the, for I, early seedlings in in February, it might be too cold. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my idea is now just a roof, bayonet around, and then some panels for the time if I need it, maybe in January or December, yeah. February. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, try it out because I don't think I can dig the foil in. And the structure is so nice. It's really beautiful. I don't really want to spoil it. And with a bayonet, it really is, is nice and useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, just because of the book, I, I think I want to try out the cloche gardening because I don't have much space and I'm seeing that I don't water well enough during normal summer times. Mm -hmm. um, my watering is a bit randomly and I have lots of losses there. Yeah. So I was wondering with, with the cloches, I might get better way than in a greenhouse or a pony tunnel. Absolutely. I, I'm a, such a fan of the bayonet cloches. I don't know if you've seen them in, um, in previous um, videos. It's a cloche that it's movable even. To, with, it's on timber and it's made out of bayonet and you can move it around. That, that book you have, I have it as well. It's a fantastic one. It's the whole garden is designed on where to put the cloche at what time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you could move those cloches. If they're maybe three meters by one meter, just fit over one bed, and you have the hoops with the rigid plastic on a wooden frame, and you can just uh, move them around. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think I, I, I use them a lot. Where are you yeah. based, Birgit? I'm, um, I'm actually doing the Jim Cronin course as well. Um, You're learning Claire? Yeah, I'm no, I'm very near to Claire. I'm in Balinar County, uh, Tipperary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, and I have another question about the strawberries. Re did you read that out? Um, the strawberries. I'm not sure I have the strawberry question, Brigitte. Um, okay, I need to look. At, so I have always trouble to get nice runners from of any sort of strawberry going. And um, now I'm in the community garden as well, and there are lots of strawberries and I collected runners. And I also um, raised some nice stra strawberry plants now that I want to transfer in my own garden. But now mm -hmm. I'm aware of all the kind of diseases that are present in the community garden as there are eelworms, um, uh, blight, definitely blight always every year. And yeah, yeah. blight comes Blight comes to every garden. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you, it spreads around in the air. It, it doesn't miss an inch of Ireland, blight spores. Um, eelworms, potatoes, eelworms, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's more serious, yeah. So I was wondering if I have now put my lovely stro strawberry plants that I intended to transfer in my own garden, if there are eelworms presents, I bring them home. And I might not better do that. Or what, what do you think? Yeah, the, the, there might be. The potato cyst ilberm is a problem because once you have it, you, you can't really grow potatoes well anymore. Yeah. But it depends how close they were to that area. No, they were in the plot where I have the strawberries in my... Yeah, no, I wouldn't, do it. Plot before. I wouldn't do it. So you wouldn't transfer any plants from that plot home? No. And there's only three diseases I would be worried about, three problems. One is the eelworm, the potato cyst nematode, the eelworm on potatoes, white rot on onions, and club root on brassicas. If, if they would have any of these three diseases, I wouldn't. Yeah, the eelworm definitely, and the club root, maybe. I have to check. I haven't grown brassicas yet, so. Mm. Yeah. yeah, rather be oh. careful if, if, if you, yeah. So better get the strawberries somewhere else. Mm. There's a fruit nursery called English's Fruit Nursery in Wexford. They have yeah. a good range of different types. Yeah. Okay, there was one I saw called um, Ostara, Ostara strawberries, and they are supposed to have a longer harvesting time. But I can't okay. see them. I don't know them. There are... Um, yeah. They're advertised as having a longer harvesting time. Excellent. As for their genetics, I think they're more related to a forest strawberry. What are they called? Ostara. 
O S T A O R A. Okay. Ja. Brilliant. Is that, is that cross pollination with strawberries? I think there might be, yeah. I'm not 100% sure. Good. No, thanks very much. Um, okay, oh, there good. was one other question. Um, and some of my strawberries, they always get the red, blackish spots. And usually the leaves are either very large or very small and not so well looking. The fruit gets these black spots. No, the leaves. The leaves. And it, in my eyes, it's some cause, kind of a deficiency, but I never can make out what type of deficiency, or maybe it's too much nitrogen. Or yeah, if the leaves get too big, it's too much nitrogen in relation to to uh, phosphorus. But they, they, know, if they you do that, what you should do with strawberries when they finish cropping in July or early August, you cut off all the leaves right off everything so commercial growers would do it with a strimmer they go drum but i do it more carefully i cut off all the old leaves just leave the tiny little babies and that clears up everything tidy up the whole lot ruffle the soil and then you get a fresh growth of leaves then ready for the next year mm -hmm. okay good thanks very much klaus thank you Bye. Uh, i just have a few more questions klaus on the chat uh, talking about your nettle concoction carol asks can you do that with nettles for aphids if the nettles have been stewing for a few weeks um it's more like a feed then you know when once you stew it for a number of weeks it's it's more like a liquid feed and i would hesitate probably spraying it onto the leaves of plants that you eat you know, you don't know stuff that's in it, E. coli or whatever. I I just water that around the base. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't spray that onto the leaves, unless it's a plant where you don't eat. But what plant is that where you don't eat anything from it? Okay. Um, Claire asks, just uh, going back to the soil test we saw, what would have made the zinc high in that soil analysis? That's just naturally in the soil. Okay. Some so some soils are naturally high in zinc, naturally high in manganese or magnesium or boron or naturally low in it. So that's just given. You know, the soils came from ground up rock. So whatever was mineral was in the rock and released it. That's that's what it is. Okay. And then finally Kat asks, uh, does Klaus advice or advise crop rotation of tomatoes? Or are they okay to grow each year in the central bed of a polytunnel in order to get the maximum height? Yeah, in um, the, I, I do the garden for the nuns in Bandoran, the Mercy Sisters, um, and they have the one greenhouse, which is for the nuns, and they only ever want tomatoes in there. So for the last 12 years, I've grown tomatoes in there. That's really bad organic practice, isn't it? But that's all they want, you know? So every three years, roughly, I replace the soil. So I dig out, say the middle bed there, you're referring to every three years, I dig out the soil, put it onto an outside bed and use the soil from the outside bed, put it in and improve it with good compost. I'm oh. not doing it every single year though. It's too hard work. Okay, and then one last one came in there from Irene. I've tried a few years growing celery. Any tips on getting the stems nicely blanched? Yeah, yeah. First of all, choose the right variety. If you use the common variety that are available in garden centers like golden self-blanching or rubbish like that, uh, you won't get any good stems. So right. you have to get a, a really good variety. One is... Um, one is uh, called Victoria. It's mm -hmm. a dark green, crunchy one. It's a hybrid variety. Another really good one is called Latham Blanching Galaxy, but that's the more pale ones, pale, crunchy ones. Latham Blanching Galaxy. That was very common in, in the, but the, the trend has shifted from the pale ones to the dark green ones. Both of these varieties are excellent and very crunchy. Um, it took me years to, to learn how to grow celery properly. Um, first of all, sow it into 
broadcast seeded into a tray or into a pot. So scatter the seeds without covering them. Then four weeks later, they terminate in two weeks on a heating bench or on the windowsill. Two weeks later, they terminate, wait for another two weeks, then prick them out individually into modular cells. Single seeds (laughs) per modular cells, wait for another four weeks. Four weeks. So we're from mid March, then we were in mid April to prick out, and then we are now in mid May where we are planting them out into the garden. And then you plant them exactly 27 centimeters each way staggered. Do you know what I mean? Equidistant spacing, 27 yeah. centimeters. And that forces them to grow straight up. Okay. Feed the soil well, give them plenty of manure, at least one wheelbarrow every three square meters, and then water them generously. That's the only plant that you can overwater. Yeah, and I think I forgot that, okay, look, it got very dry. It was well yeah. manured and it was Other well... plants can cope with that, but celery, if you want them crunchy and vigorous, keep watering them. Yeah. It was well draining. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the water didn't stay in. Okay, thanks. Great, you're welcome. Thanks, Irene. And that's all we've got for this evening, guys. Um, really appreciate all the questions that were pre-submitted and in the chat as well. So as I say, next week, we've got a, an exciting video from down with Rory McGurian. Then after that, uh, on October the 6th, this day, two weeks, we'll have our final Q&A session. So uh, I very much hope you enjoyed this evening and we'll talk to you again in two weeks. And Klaus, as always, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. and. Enjoy the rest of the last days of summer. (laughs) Okay, then bye. Cheerio. Bye. Thank you.